So today I plan uh, to touch on some very practical issues of revival and I hope uh, I can provoke you to think about your positioning in relation to the harvest. I also believe the Lord has a prophetic word about the great uh, awakening and how it relates to us individually and corporately. And we're going to, of course, leave an open door for the Holy Spirit to move in and take over because that's always fun. Um, so let's get right down to it. The practicalities of revival. Eh, no, let's not. Um, on the drive here this morning, there was, of course, a sign advertising a person that somebody wants to be elected to an election that is supposed to be called later today. So I was in the prayer room a little earlier and the Lord gave me this verse in Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 14 and verse 34. And I think it would be helpful if we perhaps wrote this down and dwelt on it a little bit in how we pray about this election. We're not going to get into a lot of political discussion. But Proverbs 14 and 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And I don't think the Lord needs to be wordy or say a lot of stuff, but just dwell on that verse as you pray about this election period. We're probably going to the polls on September 20th or thereabouts. But righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. And I think with that, on that subject, the Lord does a mic drop and says, enough said. So now we'll get back to the practicalities of revival. So some of us have experienced during our journey um, a point at which we were down at the end of ourselves. Uh, we cried out to God for help. And sadly, many people in the world don't reach out to the Lord under those circumstances. And a lot of that is because they don't have a Christian worldview to begin with. Only three or four percent of people these days have a Christian worldview. So when they get to rock bottom, wherever that is, God is not their automatic go back home kind of reset spot. It's all manner of other things. So we all have setbacks and, and suffering and emotions and our soul tries to soothe with the fleshly pleasures of the world. Only when all of those things fail as they ultimately do, do some reach out to the master. So let's say one of these people who did reach out to God and did encounter someone and they invited them to come to church on a random Sunday morning to faith works. Uh, then what? So just think about this. Think about us doing our normal thing and then someone different coming in what if, what if they don't look like us? Uh, what if they don't drive a car like us? What if they don't dress like us? What if there's a smell of body odor or urine or vomit or alcohol or weed? What if their hair is coiffed? and their car is made in Germany or Italy? What if their cufflinks are worth more than you make in a month? Does that stuff affect the way that we look at them, that we love them, that we present Jesus? Romans chapter 2 and verse 11 
says there is no respect of persons with God. So if God doesn't care, why should we? We need to think about this. Because <clears throat> all these people that I've mentioned have actually been here before. And some of us didn't react well. So we need to think about how we're going to react in the future. How are we going to be that person in the future that portrays the hands and feet of Jesus in this place? Um, so I've worked in a few different places over the years. One place was big on nepotism. The owners and managers favored their relatives. And a different place was big on favoritism. Uh, the friends and neighbors were favored. And those are a couple of big complaints. But there's none of that with Jesus. There's no respect to persons. But this issue is placing a value on a person's soul based on their outward appearance. And we need to think about these things before they happen again. So this is not a negative word. This is just to provoke your thinking right off the hop. Because if the Great Awakening is coming and it's going to stream in the doors, we need to get it together, people. We need to be ready, mentally prepared, and spiritually prepared, and physically prepared in every respect. So we also heard from... Uh, Pastor Alain Caron from Gatineau, Quebec. He was here a couple of years ago. And he had uh, some same-sex couples come into his church. And they got saved. And uh, then, of course, once their minds began to be renewed and their spirits renewed and their new life welled up within them, their desires for things began to change. That made it messy. Oh, but... This is a reality of people that are out there that are going to be affected by the Great Awakening that will probably stream in our door. Praise God, I hope so. And how are we going to position ourselves? All of these people need to experience the love of Christ. How will this happen? Will it be deliberate and conscious in us stepping out in faith, believing the Lord will help us be his hands and feet? It's not a negative message. It's a question for us. It's to provoke our thinking. How will we model the behavior of the Lord Jesus when we're faced with the raw recruits of the kingdom? If you are the boot camp staff, how will you shepherd these people from where they are to a delivered, healed, whole Christian life? So that's just to provoke your thinking. Be encouraged. The Lord wants you to think on these things. I had a friend in my last job, <clears throat> and he, uh, he was big on motorcycles, loved motorcycles, loved to look at them and talk about them and buy them and fix them and polish them and decorate them and ride them. And uh, he mentored another staff member to get a bike of his own and start riding and got his license and the whole deal. And I just watched the whole process and I just found it interesting and one day they were talking about safety and and John was the mentor and Jody, Jody was the mentee and John's advice to Jody was you will crash it's practically inevitable you will crash so think about how you will react when you crash and lots of times it's good to push the bike away so that it crashes separately from you when you're both sliding along the pavement. Sometimes it's better to hang on to the bike because whatever reason, they know all about that stuff. I have no idea. But as I listen to them discussing, I'm thinking to myself, this is real, this is honest. They know some things inevitably will take place and they're mentally preparing for that moment because they're trying to stave off a disaster. So, are we truly ready for the great harvest? Are we mentally prepared for it? Or do we just want a great harvest on our own terms? It's like, I think of the harvest like this. Thank you, Lord, for doing the harvest my way. No. Sorry. It's not going to be like that. Ah, God is good. So, on to our next topic. Ephesians chapter 4. Um... 
Yeah, verse 11, that's a good place to start. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together with every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So here is the basis of people we can learn from apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So what is the purpose of these offices? To equip the saints. And why do saints need to be equipped? To do the work of the ministry. To build up the body of Christ. And when will this stop? When we have unity of faith and measure up to Jesus. How's that going? Why do we need to learn the truth? To avoid trickery, winds of doctrine, craftiness, and deceitful plotting. And how do we do the work of the ministry? By speaking the truth in love. So based on what I'm reading, each of us should be able to name at least one apostle, one prophet, one pastor, one teacher, one evangelist. Can we? Everybody? Because over the years, Pastor Bell has brought in a, a stream of at least one of these people into our ministry. Not recently with COVID and restrictions and whatnot, but lots of us have learned from each of uh, the office holder of these. And we've learned some stuff, you know, uh, some churches, uh, for example, uh, Bethel Church in Redding, California, even use this verse as a leadership model. They have kind of an apostle and a, and a prophet and a pastor who are kind of the, the leadership of that church. But, you know, Pastor Bill has a certain apostolic anointing for both Prince Edward Island and for Canada. Um, and he's had the opportunity to minister both internationally while on Canadian soil and abroad. Apostle or sent one is an overseer, a church planter, and has a care and concern for unique geographical areas assigned by the Lord. And that's just one of the offices that are operating in this body. There are others as well. I wouldn't say for certain we have all five, but we certainly have three or four. So these giftings and callings are assigned to build you up, to build me up, to encourage and instruct and round out our faith. And many times it's like putting a wheel and tire on a, on a wheel balancer and you give it a little spin and the computer detects it's a little bit out of balance. So we need to turn the wheel a little bit and add a little weight and give it a thump because we're a little bit too much one way. We're enjoying this one little baby part of Jesus too much, but this part over here that we find difficult or distracting or just don't really understand it, we need to be delving into those things. Um, and now a challenge. Have you ever been part of a church plant? Anybody? Have you ever wanted to be part of a church plant? Have you ever studied church planting? Uh, if you answered yes to any of those, you should speak to pastor about it because this is an important time. The prayer warriors and the intercessors and the worship team for sure are enjoying a revival. And those with a bit of prophetic gifting are in revival here. Have you ever noticed? Are you personally experiencing revival? Do you know what it looks like or what it feels like? If your response is, brother, I'm too busy, just hanging on, well, perhaps that's an invitation from the Lord to just draw close to him. Get in the word, pray, sing, worship. I know a young man who recently experienced a pretty traumatic event emotionally, and 
Instead of allowing his soul to use his flesh to soothe that pain, he just dug into the Bible and he sought godly counsel and he prayed and worshiped and began to experience a level of personal revival that never before happened. Oh, I would hope that we would all react in just this way when adversity comes on us. So let's look at another part of revival. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, sometimes we go to church and we hear phrases like, Oh, the world, it's so dark. Really? Well, where's the light come from? I don't know. Based on that verse, that's an us problem. Not a them problem. I have heard it said that when the nation of Israel was formed, all the Christians of the world and their eschatology, and eschatology is a fancy word meaning end time revelations, decided that, you know, we're, we're almost at the rapture. So let's just pull away from all those antichristers and we'll just gather in and, and we'll do a lot of navel gazing and hold hands and pray in a circle and wait for the rapture. And the world got dark. I'm not sure if you can draw a straight line there, but I'm trying to if you didn't notice. Um, yeah. So, how does one bring light to the world where there is no more truth or authoritative source of truth or morality is in a spiral? Deviant behavior is encouraged at every turn. People posture more and more and have less and less integrity. Well, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Deal forthrightly with everyone. The jokes are fine, but not if they impinge on the truth in any way. And be careful not to bring reproach on the name of Christ. If people persecute you because you're a difficult person, that's a you problem. If people persecute you because of your walk with Jesus, you'll have a heavenly reward for that. If you get fired because you want to start a Bible study in, in, at work, well, that was perhaps unwise to begin with, and you're actually giving Christians a bad name, and you're bringing reproach on the name of Christ. But if you invite someone to study the word with you one time, that's a good and positive thing to do. If you have a course of action in mind and you have any doubts at all, seek counsel. The amount of real world practical experience in this room would stun a team of oxen. The ones down in Bridgewater that tow like six or seven, eh, it doesn't matter. Make use of the people here that have that experience. And when you seek counsel, listen to what they say. Don't just like, I sought counsel, now I'm gonna go do the thing I want to do anyway. I don't know what they said, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's wrong. Sorry. Matthew 10, 16. It says we are to be wise as serpents. Matthew 10, not 5, brother. Matthew 10, 16 says we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So, that's part two done. Now on to the next. So, we're going to read from Ruth chapter 1. I don't think we're going to read it all because it's 
22 verses. But we'll set the groundwork. Now it came to pass in the days of, in the days when judges ruled, <clears throat> that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there ten years, then both Malon and Chilion died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. And I think we'll stop reading just for the moment. Uh, yeah. So things were tough in the land of Israel. And they saw that there was bread down in Moab. So they moved. Don't know if that was a good course of action. I have a suspicion perhaps it wasn't. However... It worked, because the rest of the story makes it work. So we can relate this to some Christians who profess faith in Christ, and then they sort of give their salvation a nice quiet place on the shelf to sit while they go about their life. And it looks like uh, Naomi and her husband went to Moab because, you know, it was better there. There was some food to eat, and they perhaps got tunnel vision. They were, they were looking like in this narrow little window. And sometimes we can do that, and that's, that's a real thing. Um, does anyone ever get on a path, and they have the tunnel vision, and they're like, I picked this path. This looks like a good path. I like this path. But the tunnel vision just shows us the path and one little sprig of grass on both sides and yeah down we go down this path and after you get down the path a ways if you could really see what was going on you'd see that well over here we've got forest fires and over here we've got droughts and there we've got deserts and here we've got robbers and there is a terrorist and all manner of trouble just to the right and left of the path but we, all, all we're seeing is the path. It's just this narrow little thing. But after we've gone down the path for a while, we sort of wake up and look around and see all types of creepy things and creepy creatures really close to us. Not touching us yet, but it's a type of worldly living. Elimelech and Naomi had two sons, and they married some local girls. And... When things turned bad, Naomi's husband died, then the two sons. So having gone down that path that looked good for a while, the world suddenly had her surrounded and enveloped her existence and stole everything it could from her. So has anyone ever been there? Went down the wrong road, didn't consult the master, got in trouble. Had to dial 911. So at this point, she turned back to the promised land. Made an about face, started back up that path that she had taken in perhaps a little blindness or willful blindness. And it was at that point that she personally began to experience revival. And it affected her daughters-in-law in a different way. She said, I've got nothing for you. Turn back. You can't wait for me. I, I'm done having children. Even if I could have children, you're not going to wait without a husband until they're grown and marry them. That's just not going to work out. So go back to Moab. Go live in the house that my son built for you and have a nice life. And Orpah said no once, and then the second time, she's like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm gone. Here, give us a kiss. Let's go. But Ruth didn't do that. Let's, uh, 
Let's look at Ruth's actual reaction in verse 16. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts you from me. Whew, that was a big one. Wowzers. Even, uh, I mean, I've heard some great wedding vows, but not much is going to beat the likes of that. That was, that's pretty amazing. And, yeah, as soon as Naomi heard that, she didn't say a word. Stop speaking to her. That's a good thing. That's good. So, Naomi in a most stressful situation, turn back to the Lord. Her daughter-in-law, observing carefully, said, I want some of that too. Committed her life to be linked to her mother-in-law, which is a rare thing in and of itself, but in this case more so. So now we're going to get into the prophetic part of this. Perhaps you've heard of Generation X and Y and Z. Gen Z are the group born between 1997 and about 2014. And they're between the ages of about 7 to 24-ish. Researchers tell us that Generation Y tends to be very ideological and leftist and they were born in prosperity and just they can be dreamers, right? It's fine. Be dreamers. But Gen Z, the new crew, they're a little more pragmatic. And this is where it's going to get kind of cool. With Gen Z, they're born into a period of slightly more of an economic downturn. And when you feed them a steady diet of lies, about half of them just swallow it down whole and think nothing of it. But then there's the others who are like, my spirit says I don't want a steady diet of lies. I think I'm going to seek out some truth. And they were built this way. So the struggle is real. Gen Z has what I will refer to as a remnant who will reject the ideology of Antichrist just at face value. Just... Just no. No, we're not doing that. The inner spirit of men and women know when they are being lied to. They know. They want to see the goods. They want to see and touch and taste and feel the supernatural. And when they experience a real God, their reaction will be like Ruth. Ruth saw her mother-in-law when everything went bad, planned to return to the land of Canaan. Ruth loved her mother-in-law. That's uncommon enough, but her pledge is rare and powerful. And it echoes through the ages. And it's a today word. This remnant of Gen Z, who will see Jesus Christ as their Savior, and heaven as their home, mm. They'll be committed in a way we haven't seen in generations. We need to shut up and not discourage them. And not limit them by projecting on them our failures. Because we've tried some stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the stuff that we've tried that didn't work for us is going to work for them. Be careful not to discourage. 
<laughs> it's what a day of Holy Spirit this is. It's lining up something unreal. Because just like Jericho, when they were circling Jericho, shut up, don't say a word, seven days. And on day seven, round and round we go. And when we blow the trumpet, all right, now come on with it. Let's go. Just like we did here this morning. I wasn't talking to Janice. We pre-planned nothing. That was fantastic. That's Holy Spirit all day. Thank you, God. And folks, for anyone who's getting tired of persevering, who being in the trenches, holding up the banner of Jesus, <laughs> oh, Lord, there's a stream of reinforcements coming. And you'll not be discouraged anymore. <laughs> John the Baptist's dad was struck dumb, speechless, while the baby was in the womb. Why? Well, unbelief. Wasn't that fortuitous? Do you think his mouth would have degraded the blessing his son was about to bring into the world? The book of Matthew tells us we will have whatever we say. Geraldine called that out a few minutes ago. So what are we saying? The word tells us that it isn't what you put in your mouth that defiles you. It's what comes out. So what are we saying? Okay. That's that part. On to the next. Now I want to talk about zombies. Can we talk about zombies in church? And I say zombies because in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the word clearly states... And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the world has a way in which they portray zombies, but it's not real zombies like we are. Whoops. <laughs> Did I say that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago in the prayer room, Sister Osagi called out 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And I was just reading through it during prayer time and it talks about Moses, how he had put a veil over his face when he came down off the mountain because he'd been with the Lord. And still there's a veil over the face of the children of Israel when they read the word because the veil hasn't been broken for them. And it's still there kind of distancing them from the knowledge of God. But if we skip down to Verse 16, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So I'm going to use some words that perhaps could be misconstrued as sensual, but they're not. They're a God thing. So when Jesus was put to death, we need to really get this. A man born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, died. That sacrificial act broke the spiritual membranes of virginity. And it was represented by the veil in the temple being torn. Now the texture, the physical texture of the veil of the temple, about the closest thing that I can relate to you is a seatbelt. Anybody try to do a little tear on a seatbelt? Tough work. Next closest thing would be a Kevlar vest. I mean... Both of these things save lives. But that was ripped open in order to pull back the curtain between life and death. In the natural, the physical veil protecting the Holy of Holies was torn in two. In the spiritual realm, the membrane of virginity had been overcome, the virgin 
has become the impregnated virgin. The seed of God is planted in us. When we accept the free gift of the finished work of the cross, we check the box that says we're eligible to be infilled by the Holy Spirit. We are in a gestational stage. The Holy Spirit working within us is manifesting something. Why is there such a push to exterminate the residents of wombs the world over? Because the enemy knows that there is an irresistible, unstoppable force being birthed, being formed, and getting ready to be released. This is why the world hates us. The spirit, their spirit, sees our baby bump. This is a jealousy of what we carry. They want it so bad but are so unwilling to lay down their pride and get located spiritually that they just want to kill it. If I can't have it on my terms, you can't have it either. That's their thinking. Their soul and spirit are at war within, so their expression of this is to hate us. Their spirit hears the call of Jesus. They can hear Jesus calling. They can hear him. They hear the invitation, and their soul is just raging inside. Don't listen to that sound of heaven. There's so many things that we can satisfy your flesh with and numb and soothe your pain with and get your soul off in a different direction with. Oh, with those precious few who are willing to lay down their pride and their choices and turn from wickedness and become zombies. The goodness, oh, the goodness. Oh, the taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You are zombies for Jesus. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We have been raised to life. The world portrays zombies as bad, but actually only Christians are true zombies. And you're beautiful. Every move you make that's in favor of the kingdom of heaven, the Lord's cheering you on. You know, you can attend a hockey match at the East Link Center, or you can go to Central Canada, go to the Bell Center, big hockey game. You can go to the um, biggest uh, football stadium in the United States, the MetLife Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Uh, there's like about 100,000 people go there and watch the New York Giants play. In a playoff game, in an intense moment, when the home team wins, the roar is deafening. But pales in comparison to the way Jesus cheers when he sees you making a move on his behalf. It does not approach nothing that man can do can approach the enthusiasm the master has for you. Can never drown out his love for us, his cheers for us, his absolute joy as we make a move on behalf of the Christ, the anointed one, the king of glory. So, that is pretty much the end of my message. Today we talked about some practical parts of revival. We talked about how we are prepared for a life of ministry. We talked about lighting the world, about being filled with the Spirit, about becoming undead in Jesus. Now, next week, there will be a baptism here. Lord willing, if you desire to go through the waters of baptism and make a public declaration of your faith before God and women, also men, here's a chance. Talk to pastor, let him know. And we almost always invite last minute entries as well. Come prepared to dive in if you don't want to say you do, but you're feeling it. Be ready. It's good. So now that we've reached the end, I just want to speak a few verses over you. If you please stand. In Ephesians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit, in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, 
may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.